Um, you will find in the uh, bulletin this week, uh, I have the, included the Holy Week schedule so that you have uh, the times for uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. Um, just so you know, uh, Holy Thursday, so that's uh, in a couple weeks, uh, I think April 14th. Uh, a Holy Thursday will be here uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, then Good Friday will be 3 p.m. in Blanchardville. And uh, the Easter Vigil, uh, Saturday evening at 8 o'clock, I believe, um, although the diocese hasn't said that, but I'm assuming 8 o'clock in Hollandale. And then the Easter morning Masses will be the regular 8.15 here, and then 10.30 in Blanchardville. Um, I do need some volunteers for those uh, Masses and services for Holy Week. Uh, so there is a sign-up sheet in the back of the church, if you would be willing, if you are a Eucharistic minister or reader or a server, uh, to serve one of those or more of those times. That would be greatly appreciated. So I have to warn you that uh, my homily this morning is kind of three different things, and I didn't have a good way of transitioning between them, so uh, we're just going to have to kind of deal with that. But I guess if you could find a through line between those three messages, it would be uh, the role of good parents in our lives. So first, uh, this weekend, we are starting a significant effort for our parish, and we need your help. After Mass, I'm going to ask each family or individual to bring home a copy of our census so that you can fill it out and bring it back in the coming weeks. So the census will look something like this. Rosemary Murphy, one of our trustees, has graciously written about this in our bulletin, but I wanted to add a few words in, of encouragement. So we're, we are asking you to help us with the census for a few reasons. First, our database for the parish is seriously lacking. and This is one of the first things I noticed when I got here. We don't have contact information for a number of people, and for some, what we have is out of date. We need to be able to keep in contact with you so that we can let you know what is happening in our parish. Second, we simply don't know how many people we have. Every year when we send, uh, we send the parishioner counts to the diocese, and this affects a lot of things like the diocesan assessment, how much we owe the diocese. And since we can only give an estimate, really a pre-COVID estimate, we could be way off. And third, we need to know how best to serve you, our parishioners. By collecting this information, we will know better what is needed in the parish. Please know we are asking you to pro provide for us the best information that you can. If you don't know specific sacramental dates, I understand. If you do not feel comfortable sharing certain information, I will not force you to. And also, please remember that this information is confidential. I'm not going to sell your information to outsiders. We won't share this with anyone except the relevant information like parish numbers, to, of the numbers of parishioners to the diocese. And then on the back page, you will find a sign up for volunteers. I'm asking that everyone, everyone, everyone agrees to help the parish in some way. Studies show that only 10% or fewer of parishioners are actually involved in volunteer work for the parish. This does not work because some jobs just don't get done and the people who keep volunteering over and over and over get burnt out. Without your help, our parish cannot keep going. We need everyone to step up and do their part. Please give a little of your time to help with one of the liturgical roles in the Mass, or the Knights of Columbus, or CCW, or with the parish councils, or with religious education. And if you are already helped with one or more of these, please indicate that you would be willing to continue. This is especially important for the ministries, the liturgical roles, like readers and Eucharistic ministers, because once we have a list of volunteers, I will be having training sessions for both the new volunteers as well as those who are returning. So we're all on the same page. Now, why is this important? And this is, I'm specifically here talking to parents. I was blessed to grow up with parents 
with parents who gave a lot of their time in the parish. My mom, for instance, was the sacristan for daily mass. So, yes, she took us to daily mass every day before we went to school. My dad helped out in music. He played the piano. He sang everything every Sunday. They both helped to lead and participate in Bible studies and in other things in the parish. And this instilled in us, the children, that this was part of our life. We grew up as altar servers, serving basically every Sunday. And then when I got older, I became a cantor. I sang for roughly seven years at parish. And I was also a sacristan certain days. Parents, please set a good example for your children and build up the virtue of service in our parish. I thank you for your help with this process. Both the census and the volunteering are essential for continuing our wonderful parish of St. Isidore's. May God bless all of you and your help. So now I warned you there's going to be an abrupt pivot here. Now I never do something like this, but I feel as your pastor I need to make you aware of something and ask for your assistance in sending a message that we will not give in to the prevalent progressive, anti-Christian message being peddled by so many mainstream products. Now, you may not know this, but I am a big Disney fan. I've already mentioned before my love of Star Wars, although I don't really think of Star Wars as Disney, but it is now. But I've also been a big fan of Pixar. In fact, one of my longest-running streaks was that I saw every Pixar movie in the theater from Toy Story up until I heard that there was a gay character in Onward, and then COVID hit. And unfortunately, Disney has been a massive proponent of the LGBTQ and other progressive junk. They have been inserting it in small ways for years, but now they are becoming even more blatant about it. Now, a lot of people dismiss it as, oh, it's just a brief mention, it doesn't hurt anybody. But that's how they get it ingrained in ours and in our children's consciousnesses. A little here, a little there, and it becomes normal and acceptable. And the next movie, which is about Buzz Lightyear, I was really looking forward to it because he's one of my favorite characters. But it has now come out that they are proudly including a same-sex kiss in a children's movie. This is all part of the larger ploy to normalize these things. Disney and Pixar have also come out strongly against the new Florida legislation, which is meant to save children from being indoctrinated. They have these messages now in their movies, all over their social media, and everywhere they can. We need to take a stand as Catholics and say we will not tolerate these types of things in children's movies, and in products. It has to start somewhere. We need to be more and more careful about what we are letting our children watch. Just because it is Disney, or just because it is animated, does not mean it is okay for children. So for my part, I have decided to cancel my Disney subscription, and I would encourage all Christians to do the same, basically to boycott Disney. This is especially important for parents to send this message. We can get by without their propaganda. They cannot get by without our money. So let's send a message to Disney and all of the other quote-unquote woke corporations that we will not stand for their attempts to corrupt our children and our society. Now, I need to talk about our gospel today. And of course, our gospel today is the parable of the prodigal son. And I want each of us to think, which of the two sons do I most relate to today? First, we have the so-called prodigal son, the younger son who asks his father for his inheritance. And then he goes off to a distant country and squanders it on a life of dissipation. Now, if you don't know, that means wasting his money on sensual pleasures. This son then lives in a desperate situation, barely getting by, until he finally realizes he should go home and beg his father for help, even to treat him as a hired worker. 
The father, when he sees him, is filled with compassion, runs and embraces him, and tells his servants to set up a big feast. The older son, when he hears of this, is angry and refuses to enter the house. He is angry with his brother for wasting his inheritance, but he is more angry with his father because he has never had a feast like this for him, even though he was always faithful. Now, most of us at some time in our life can sympathize with each of these sons. We have been sinful. We have even hit rock bottom and felt unworthy to be in God's presence. We have been, on the other hand, we have been jealous of the good fortune of another. Or we have been angry that others have been celebrated even though they are sinners and we have stayed true to God. This is my challenge for all of us this week. Sometime read this gospel again and think about which son we feel closest to at this moment and how that should affect the rest of our Lent. If we place ourselves in the shoes of the youngest son, how do we return to God? The most immediate answer is to go to confession, receiving his mercy, and then go to Mass and receive his love in the Eucharist. We are never so far gone that we cannot return. God has given us the means to return to him. He wants us to return to him. He gives us the proverbial fattened calf in the form of the sacraments to bless us and welcome us home. We have to make the first steps to realize we do not have to live in dire need in the squalor of sin. We can come to our senses and beg God for forgiveness. Others feel like the oldest son. You have always remained faithful to God and your duties to your family. You have lived a righteous life, but yet others who seem to be less virtuous seem to be more successful. Rather than focusing on others, take some time to really examine how God has blessed you. Hear God the Father saying to you, My son or my daughter, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. See what a blessing this life is and be thankful for those gifts. If someone returns to the faith, be thankful for that as well. If someone turns their life around, be a support for them. Rejoice with them that they have been saved. Understand, too, that the older son, while he thinks of himself as righteous, clearly has his own issues that he needs to work on. He is angry. He practices rash judgment. He is jealous, and he refuses to, to, sh- to show mercy. Truly, each of us can rejoice, as this Sunday calls for in Lent. We can rejoice because God will never leave us. No matter how far we have strayed, we can always turn back. We can reap the rewards of Christ's work of reconciliation for us. As St. Paul says, we can rejoice that God reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting our trespasses against us. We can turn to God and hear him say, This son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found.